You remember that Steve Martin thing we used to say, oh, let's get small. And people, instead of getting high, let's get small. Now, let's get fat. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get fat by talking about the Doctrine of Eyes, number four. It's our fourth <sighs> time into the Doctrine of Eyes. You would think, the Doctrine of Eyes, I mean, how many times can you talk about the Doctrine of Eyes? I can talk about the Doctrine of Eyes a lot. In fact, I could talk about anything a lot. And it's because I have a lot of energy for this. And I have a lot of energy for this because I put a lot into this. I cultivate this. And so it grows. It continues to grow. Anything you plant and cultivate and nourish will grow. And if you plant and cultivate and nourish these ideas, they will grow in you and you will have energy for them. They will start to begin to have a life of their own. They will start to direct your life. They will start to become bigger than you, bigger than your life, which is exactly the object of this whole thing. Okay, Jack, here are the beans. Go plant them. You get the beans, Jack, and you go outside and you plant them. And while you sleep at night, these beans grow. They grow in the beanstalks and they grow up to this other place. And so you get all frisky and you decide to climb the beanstalk. And your mother says, no, Jack, don't climb the beanstalk. And so you go and you climb the beanstalk anyway. And you go up to this other place in the clouds. Don't go to heaven. Don't go there. You know, instead of finding the goose that laid the golden egg, you find people with wings floating around playing harps and singing some kind of weird songs and streets of gold and all that stuff. And what good's that? Because you can't bring it back here and spend it. And if the earth were made of gold, a man would die for a handful of dirt. Well, what do you think people would die for in heaven? A handful of dirt, because everything's gold. Well, then gold is valueless there. But here, you see, the people who made it up here, those people, they were selling blue sky. So they said, well, you know, it's all gold up there. Oh, goody, that's where I want to go. Why? Because I'm greedy. That's why. So we've made greed a virtue. That's really insane when you think about it. That's the traditional way of dealing with things. Notice that these are kind of mixing here a little bit. Our state is described in this work with a parable. And the parable is called the parable of the driver. The driver is a carriage driver. Back in the old days, before gasoline engines started polluting the earth, we were polluting the earth in some other way. We were polluting the earth with horses and carriages, and people were going around sweeping up after the horses, and the horses were, everything was muddy and nasty, and people were going cleaning up after this. We were always polluting in some way, because that's what we do. In order to live life, you've got to have fuel going in, and you've got to have waste going out. And that's the way it is. And so it's nothing new today. It's just different. We like to blow everything up to it. It's just horrible. Oh, it's just horrible what we're doing to the earth. It's just horrible what we're doing to our bodies. It's just horrible. And people have been doing horrible things forever. It's what we do. It's the way we are. This work parable describes our state as a driver in a public house. This is an English parable, meaning it came from English language from Great Britain. And a public house is a bar, and the driver of the carriage is like a taxi driver. But there's a horse, and there's a carriage, and then there's the taxi driver, and then there's the passenger. Because what good is the taxi without a passenger? The driver, instead of being on top of the carriage with a passenger in the carriage, going where the passenger wants to go so that he can get paid to do that, he is instead in the bar. And he's drinking in the bar. And while he's drinking in the bar, the carriage and the horse are all being neglected. And the carriage and the horse are his only means of actually going somewhere real. You see, in the bar, it's not real. In the bar, he's in there drinking. And that's not real life. We all know that people go to bars and drink for other reasons than to be in real life. Oh, I think I'll go and have a real life in a bar. We don't look at it that way, do we? And if we do look at it that way, we know that we've already lost some of our marbles. So the first step is to awaken the driver, according to this parable. What is the driver drinking? If you think about literally drinking, when you literally go to a bar or you go wherever you go and drink, what is it that you are really doing? What do you really do when you begin to drink, literally? Yes, Steve. You numb yourself to whatever is bothering you outside. So one of the things is you numb yourself. What is it, Diana? Same thing. Same thing. Pat? Go to sleep. You go to sleep. Intoxicate mm -hmm. yourself. You intoxicate yourself. And what does that mean to intoxicate yourself? What's the purpose? Intoxicate yourself is good. The purpose is to intoxicate yourself. What does that mean? To literally put toxins Poison. in yourself. That's not really what that means psychologically, is it? So you're still looking at it from your body to go away from reality. Yes. We intoxicate ourselves to alter our consciousness to alter our perception so that the things that bothered us five minutes ago or five drinks ago no longer bother us. Isn't that it? It's really kind of an escape. So what is it that he's drinking? 
The drink is imagination. He's drinking imagination. So he's in this bar and he's drinking imagination because it's raining out there and he doesn't want to sit on top of the carriage and get wet. And the horse is being obnoxious or whatever and he doesn't want to deal with an obnoxious horse. So he stays in the bar and he drinks. He imagines. When people do begin to drink, literally, what is it they do? They boast. Have you been to a bar? Have you been around drunks? What do drunks do? Fight. They fight, but what do they fight about? Grandiose ideas and about how wonderful <laughs> they are. Or... People boast and they begin to reveal their secret imagination, how wonderful they really are. And when you're wonderful, why you're in there drinking and imagining is because no one else is recognizing it. No one else ever really appreciates us for how wonderful we really are. And this is our secret imagination about ourselves, is how wonderful we really are and how no one else really ever appreciates us. No matter how much we do for them, they're never grateful enough. They never really say thank you enough. And when they do, they don't really mean it. And when they buy us a gift, it's not really a great gift like they'd buy themselves. And when they do something for us, it's not really what they would like somebody to do for them. In other words, people don't appreciate us for how wonderful we actually are. And that's the imagination that we are constantly sipping on. You can see it could be a big problem. And you can see you could end up fighting with people about that, couldn't you? But we would never do that. Husbands and wives never fight. There's no such thing as divorce in this country. It's well over 50% nationwide. Well, how did that happen? Oh, well, I just married the wrong person. How many times have you married the wrong person? Well, a number of times, but <clears throat> we'll not talk about that. And before you started marrying these people, how many of the wrong people were you in relations? Well, all of them. Well, except there was this one guy, or there was this one woman, and that was the right one, but I let that one get away, or that one. And it's all a lie. But we won't go into that right now. This is one of the hidden sources of internal account. Our self-romance with imaginary eye and false personality. We imagine that we are something that we're not. And that builds this personality that has surrounded us, that life has grown on us, that our interaction with life has grown on us. Just like moss growing in the cracks of the bricks outside, just like moss growing on the side of a tree or on the side of a rock, personality grows over who we really are. And just like moss can act as like a buffer to keep anything from really getting to the tree or the bricks or whatever, this personality acts like a buffer and keeps things from getting through to us. So the impressions in life don't really get into us. And impressions are food. And if those impressions don't get into us, if they're stopped before they get to us, to the essential part of us, then the essential part of us gets weaker because it's not getting fed. But the personality that's filtering all of this, that's taking all these impressions to itself and using them for its own purposes, it's getting fed and it's growing stronger and stronger. And all the time it's getting stronger, it's imprisoning the essential you and keeping it weak and keeping it in a dark place, in solitary confinement, as it were. So the false personality ends up being like a prison. And down inside, locked down inside, is the essential you that's kept away from the light, from impressions coming in. It only gets fed whatever's left over, whatever false personality wants it to have, which isn't much. So this leads us to the first form of lying that we need to study in ourselves. Why is it that I say we need to study this in ourselves? Because studying this in other people isn't going to help us. We already know how everybody else is a liar. Nobody needs to tell us about that. This is not news. We already know everybody else is a liar. We all know other people lie. We know that we do too, but we're always justified in lying. Whenever we lie, it's to spare their feelings because they're so weak and pitiful. Whenever we lie, it's so that we don't hurt other people. When they lie, they're just liars. When we tell something that happened to us, we almost always tell it to our advantage. We change it. We don't change it in big ways because we're very clever. We'll just leave something that we said out or we'll just slightly overemphasize something that we said. So when you have to report a conversation between you and another, it's nearly impossible to put it rightly. We report it to our advantage. Trickily, we can turn this around, putting ourselves in a bad light through some kind of sick, twisted self-pity that we're hoping will be rewarded in some way. Now, people are laughing now because they're seeing this. Oh, I've done that. So I caught Lori doing that last night at dinner with the cat. The cat jumped on the table. The little kitten jumped on the table. And Lori made this face. How I suffer with this cat. The long-suffering Lebanese matron face. She rolled her eyes and oh, sighed, this cat. You know, and it's like, oh, this cat. Now, of course, I'm exaggerating this for dramatic effect and to get the point across. But it was pretty dramatic, wasn't it? For those of us who were there, it was like, dude, lighten up. This is what kittens do. 
but I've trained this cat. This cat just drives me crazy. Oh, this cat. This cat sleeps all day, and then as soon as I want to come home after working so hard all day, and as soon as I hit the bed, the cat comes to life and runs all over the room and all over me. Oh, the cat. Yeah, it's really awful. Just terrible. I feel so sorry for you. And that's our reward. Somebody feels sorry for us, that's our reward. We got what we wanted. Here we are, people are convinced that they can speak unbiased truth about themselves and others. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. Go watch Perry Mason or any court thing. People go up there and they'll put their hand on the Bible and swear to God they're going to tell the truth. You know they're going to lie. They know they're going to lie. The judge knows they're going to lie. The plaintiff, the defendant, the lawyers, everybody in the world knows that they're going to lie. Now the game is, who's going to get caught lying? And that's really all it's about, isn't it? Is the judge going to be sharp enough to catch the biggest liar? Is the judge going to be able to sort through the lies to get to some semblance of truth, some reflection of truth somewhere? And that's why people love Judge Wapner, Judge Judy, Judge Joe, Judge Harry, Judge whatever. They love it. And they watch these shows because they want to see if somebody can get through the lies. Is somebody going to be able to bring the truth out of all this mass of lies? Because there's money involved a lot of time. And when there's money involved, people always tell the truth. Yeah, all right. People are convinced, though, that they can speak unbiased truth about themselves and others. Convinced, absolutely convinced. You go to any police officer, any insurance investigator, and you say, so tell me, uh, how much of your investigation and how much of your report is going to depend on witnesses? And they'll go, well, not much. They're going to have to have a lot of corroborating evidence before they'll ever believe a witness. Why? Because witnesses are unreliable. The bank robber comes in, he robs the bank. You ask six people how tall he was, you'll have six different answers. Unless they hurt each other, then the answers will be closer. But if they're all asked separately and they can't hear the other ones, they'll all be different. What color hair? It's going to be brown. What color eyes? Well, he had glasses on. What were they, sunglasses? Yeah, they were sunglasses. That's our way of saying we can't remember what color eyes he had. We didn't look. All I know is he had this big gun. Like if someone were to tell the truth, it's like, I don't know, was there a guy there? All I saw was a gun and my own death, imminent. I saw my brains being blown all over the wall, so I just cried and whimpered and wet my pants. So I don't know what happened. But nobody says that. Or hardly anybody says that. Mostly people make something up. And so police officers, investigators, they don't really believe what they're told. They try to find corroborating evidence to what they're told because people are not reliable. Of course, there are more and less truthful eyes in us. This is a fact. There are a lot of eyes in us. Some of them are more truthful. Some of them tend to exaggerate more. Depending on the circumstances we're in, the situation that we're in, we'll see less truthful eyes coming up. Fun-loving eyes, you know, that just want to make everybody laugh. Fun-loving eyes that just want to twist everything and make it ridiculous so that it obfuscates the fact. We don't call that lying. We call that just kidding around. Or just joking. I was just joking. The point of all this, being truthful in the work, is not a moral issue, but it's on the possible development of essence, which cannot grow in pretense and falsity. Essence can only grow in the light, in the truth. It can't grow in pretense and falsity. It must have a steady diet of what is actually so. You can't pretend to be something that you're not and expect essence to be touched by that because essence is your essential self. It's who you really are. And you have to know where you really are and who you really are before you can move from where you really are. If you move from some other place, you're not moving from where you are. So then you're not really moving. You're just in the public house drinking imagination. You're imagining something. So it's essential for our own development of essence that we remove pretense and falsity. The growth of essence is prevented by those eyes which habitually lie to protect false personality and to justify everything, to twist everything to our own advantage. Out of fear, this is what false personality does. It twists everything to its advantage. It lies habitually because it has to, because it's not really you, and because it wants you to think it's really you, and it wants everyone else to think it's really you, it's got to keep the show going. And if you can step back from that at some point in your life and look out at that, if you can get false personality out in front of you, and you can look at it, observe it like an interesting stranger, like a clown doing an act or like an actor doing an act, if you can do that, you can begin to see what it's up to. And it's not a pretty picture. And this is what we're trapped inside of. Unfortunately, most of us don't feel trapped. Most of us feel like, that's me. Well, that is me. We call it I. So no matter what it says, we say, I think. No matter what it feels, we say, I feel. No matter what it thinks, we say, I think. And we believe it. We really believe that is what I think. And it's only when we begin to get behind it that we can see anything differently. So this is why it's so important to tell the truth to your teacher. 
Remember last week we talked about telling the truth to your teacher. Well, why? Can someone tell me why it's so important to tell the truth to your teacher? No. See, nobody knows. Nobody really knows. Well, because you said so. Because telling the truth is important. Yes, Matthew. Um, because it's essential to discovering where you actually are so that you can go from there as opposed to wasting all this time trying to hide where you are from your teacher. It's a collaborative effort. Good answer. It's a little roundabout, but it's a good answer. But that's how we come upon things, isn't it? We kind of come around them and then we hone in on them. We start off moving in this direction and that direction, then we find it and we narrow it down and we start to hone in on it. And then we find the point and then we go to it, which is fine. It's a good way to think in your seat instead of on your feet. So yes, that's true. This exercise of telling your teacher the truth is an exercise in which you learn to tell the truth to yourself. You learn how to tell the truth to yourself by telling the truth to someone that you have chosen and said, okay, this is going to be my teacher. This is the person I'm going to listen to. This is the person who is going to be able to say, no, you're wrong. It's this way. And you, as an experiment, say, okay, I'm wrong. It's this way. And then verify it. Because it's always an experiment. You'll never believe it. When someone says, no, you're wrong, you won't believe it. But the very best you can do is you can say, okay, I'm going to put a tack here, right here in this spot. And that's going to be the spot. And now I'm going to explore and experiment and see. And if you're very sincere and very honest and you really value this work and you really value the goal of finding out who you are, very often you will find out that they were right and you were wrong. And that's good because when you find that out, you've got a real tack. You've got a real point on the map, a genuine point you could tie a string to and you can go out from there to other points. And you'll always know how to get back to that point, the one thing about you that you've discovered that's true. And that one thing is that you can't be counted on to always tell yourself the truth or to tell the truth about yourself. And so you need attack. And the reason sometimes when you're around me, you feel like you sat on attack is because when you get the point, it doesn't always feel good. It doesn't always make false personality go all giggly and bubbly. Oh, that's so wonderful. Like somebody coming up and say, God, you're just so sexy. Are you married? Oh, you're married. Oh, do <laughs> you have a twin sister? And you see what that does? Like, oh, 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 somebody wants me. Somebody thinks I'm sexy. Somebody wants me. Oh, me, me. And even though you know you're a frumpy, fat, had five kids, don't care anymore. Who wants sex? Leave me alone. Just let me have some sleep and take care of the kids if you really love me. Even though you've turned into that kind of a person, if somebody starts blowing that smoke at you and it's all, oh, you're all a gaga about it. That's just an insanity, isn't it? Now, you know, if you stop and look at it, it's like, that's crazy. I'm not going to do that. But we don't. We get right in that house. We get right in the bar and we start drinking. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> that's a, you got another drink, sir? Would you buy me another drink, mister? Maybe we could get together later, you know, like after a couple more drinks. And there you go. You're off in this insane affair with your imagination because there's nobody there. There's nobody there. Whoever's blowing the smoke, there's nobody there. Because when they find out what you're really like, they're not going to be there. Is that your experience or not? This isn't anything I'm asking you to believe. This is something I'm asking you to look at your life and see if it hasn't worked out that way. Where we are is we can't tell ourselves the truth. We can't get beyond imaginary eye and false personality. Imaginary eye and false personality can't ever give us inner development. So you see, it's really not a moral issue, but it's a practical issue. This is all about inner development. I don't care whether you think I'm a liar or not. That doesn't matter to me. Why would I care? You would have to know the truth for me to care about what you thought. When I say care about what, what you think, I don't mean I don't care about what you think. I mean that when it comes to you telling me about the truth, I don't put a lot of value in that. Now, that doesn't mean I don't put any value in it. I weigh it according to your ability to tell yourself the truth. If you can tell yourself the truth, you can really tell yourself the truth. And we can all verify that about each other, whether someone can really tell themselves the truth. If you can tell yourself the truth, I'm a lot more inclined to have you tell me the truth because I know you know what you're talking about. But if like you're just like, oh, Oh, yes, I'm just this wonderful person and God gave me this gift to tell everybody else the truth. Well, tell it somewhere else. I'm not interested in wonderful <gasps> God-given gifts that don't apply to you first. If we begin to see presently our false attitudes, our intonations, the ways of conceiving our own value, the false blaming that we participate in, then this begins to open the door to seeing it and all of these things that we've done in the past. So if we can see this now, we start to look and see that we've done this in the past. This is not new. We start to look at our lives in the past and we say, well, that didn't work out and that didn't work out and that didn't work out. And then we begin to see that this is why, that we were always there, that we were always doing the same thing, that we were always running the same game, that we get to the bar and we always order our favorite drink. And everybody's is a little bit different. Well, I'll have this and I'll have that. And then the bartender makes the recipe and we don't even know if it's that or not. 
we don't really care at this point. All we know is that our pride and vanity demand this, because it's a distinction that makes us separate from everybody else. You see, the thing is, that when we begin to see these things about ourselves presently, and we begin to see them in our past, it opens things up for us. Life is this compact thing that is lying coiled up in us. Think of it as a rope. See, I used to sail. I used to have a couple sailboats. And sailors, real sailors, because I wasn't a real sailor. I was just a guy who bought a sailboat and wanted to sail. I just had this idea that I wanted to do this. And I saw sailboats and I thought, wow, that looked like a lot of fun. And I think at the time I had a job doing handwork on racing sails in a sail loft. And there was a boat yard, and of course there were sailboats, and there were salty types who carried ditty bags instead of wallets, things like that. And there was just this whole thing, this whole romantic thing with the sea. I was living in Florida at the time, so there was a lot of sea around and very little land. So you didn't have to go far in Florida to get to water. Sailing was something that you could do a lot of. You had the time and the money. I got the idea to sail, but then you had to learn how to sail. And of course, you don't just buy a sailboat and know how to sail. Not like a motorboat, you know, where you just point the steering wheel, you point the bow of the boat, you push the gas lever thing up, and you point the steering wheel where you want to go, and you go there. It's not that way. A sailboat's quite different. You can't just point it. You have to depend on the wind. The wind is coming from where you want to go. How are you going to get there? Well, just forget it. Don't sail today. Well, that's a great idea, and a lot of people do that. But sometimes you go out sailing, and then you want to go home, and then the wind is coming from where you want to go. Then how do you get home? Take a taxi? You can't. You've got to learn. And so you've got to tack. You've got to go in some direction other than home in order to use the wind to get closer to home. And then you've got to tack again. You've got to come about and tack again and move in some other direction other than, which is usually the opposite direction you were just going. So instead of a straight line, you zigzag to the point you want to go to. They call that beating to windward. And boy, I'll tell you what, that may not mean much to you now, but you do it for a few hours and it'll make a big difference. When you hear beating to windward, you'll go, Oh, I remember that. And that's the difference between ideas and practical application of those ideas. If you've never done that, you are not going to have the same experience as if you've done that. On a sailboat, one of the things you have to do, you have a lot of lines because everything's connected by lines. There's lines for the anchor. There's lines for hooking up the shore to a buoy. There's lines to hold on to the sails, to different parts of the sails so that you can get the sail to do what you want it to do. So you can hoist it up and you can pull it in and you can trim it and do this and do that. You do all this stuff with lines. And those lines, if they're just thrown all around, they start to get tangled and you trip in them and you go overboard and you die because your sailboat sails away and you're left out there bobbing a shark bait or whatever's out there. And that's not a good thing. So you keep your lines properly coiled. And so when I think of life, I think of a coil like on a sailboat line, a sheet line. If it's properly coiled, it's all wound up. Now it could be a very long line, but it is compact. It's coiled up in this one form, this one little form and it looks very neat and ship shape. Life is like that. It's like this compact line that's all coiled up in us. And when we die, we take this coil with us. It may be easier to change the past than the future just because the past presents itself to us a lot more readily than the future does. You learn some things about yourself today and the past will present itself. It will just present, it will just come up. It will arise and present itself and show you things where that relates, where what you noticed about yourself relates to something in the past. And when you do that, you actually are changing your past because you can never do that again. Once you see this thing about yourself, it becomes less powerful. It becomes less mechanical. It becomes more conscious. And the more you see it in the past, then the more it affects the past, but it also the more it affects the present, and also the more it affects the future. So when you see it, it does not have the same power over you. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And there it is. When you know how it works and you continue to let it work, it's because you want to stick your head in the sand. You want to be fooled. You want to go that way. But once you have really learned, once you have really seen something about yourself, it does not have the power over you that it once had. And that is how we can make progress in this work. And that's why we can make progress in this work, because the light of consciousness begins to cure us of our maladies. And these things that make us do these crazy things are maladies. The things that make us lie are maladies. Believing that we're something that we're not is a malady. It's an illness. It's a problem. It's not the way we really are. Lying doesn't have to be in words. A single look, a gesture, an intonation, a casual mannerism, a sigh, a heartbroken expression. These are all lies. I'm not going to beat this one to death because we've already beat this one to death. So we don't need to beat it to death anymore. We all know how wonderfully we've behaved. And we all know about the intolerable conditions to which we've been subjected. We all know how our childhood was just horrible. 
Other people had it a lot better. We all know that a lot of the things that we deal with today is because of our childhood. I've met people who had a wonderful childhood. Nothing ever went wrong. Okay, they grew up on some other planet, some other solar system, some other experience than this one. Fine by me. I've met lots of Martians or whatever they are. So that's no big surprise for me. The thing is that we all lead imaginary lives within ourselves. Your childhood is worse than anybody else's childhood. Your father or your mother did something that no other mother or no other father did. My mother had a disease and she was in a wheelchair and she used to get me in a corner and run the wheelchair thing into me. Boom, 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 over and over again. Now, did that ever happen to you? No. Well, see, my childhood's different. That's why I'm the way I am, because my mother did that. Okay, so you're different than everybody else. That's your own special little imaginary thing and that's how it is. And we cling to that. I ask you to let that go. Oh, no, that really happened. I'm not saying it didn't really happen. I'm saying let it go. Oh, no, I can't let that go. That defines who I am. Great. So if you're defining who you are with that, with the things that happened to you in life, how can you ever find the essential you, which isn't defined by what happened to you in life, which is defined by who you really are? This romance takes a great deal of force and prevents real self-observation. Whether it's strong and cheerful, the guy whose mother ran into him with the little wheelchair thing, he's strong and cheerful in life. You know, his chin comes out, no matter what it is, keeps a stiff upper lip and he's strong and cheerful. Keeps a positive attitude and he goes onward and gets the job done. Or whether it's this imaginary life inside of us, whether it's misunderstood, never having had a chance, doesn't really matter. How about this guy? This guy, he's had such a tragic life, but look at what he's made of it. He didn't let it get him down. He kept pulling and kept pushing and even through all the tragedy and just look at his face you can see the tragic look on his face and how long-suffering he is i know now the other one who's successful and he's at the helm of the ship through the bombs and the rain and all of the wind and he's still at the helm you know drenched but he's still strong and cheerful but the other guy here he is you know he's going through the same storm but he's all He's suffering all the way through, and he's just as strong because he's doing it. But boy, he's suffering when he's doing it. And that's our story, you know, one way or the other. That's our story. And we are loath to give up our story. No matter what it is, which side of it is, it's all self-hypnotism. It's all lie. It's all just lies that we're telling ourselves that we are wrapped up in so that we don't even know where the lie starts and where the truth begins anymore. We've told the story so many times we don't really even know anymore what the truth is. We only know the best version of the story that we've come up with so far. Think about it. And if you're really being sincere and honest with yourself, and if you've taken any time to observe yourself, you've got to see this. And it is kind of comical in a sad, tragic way. Self-emotions are very powerful, and they're constantly clustering around imaginary I, and they're all sad and tragic. Self-emotions are all sad and tragic. We did it all in spite of all the things that happened to us. Here I am today in spite of everything that has happened to me. Here I am today in spite of all the people who didn't love me who said they did. Here I am today still going in spite of all of the betrayal, in spite of all of the lying, in spite of all the treachery, in spite of all the falsity and the pretense in other people. Smell that? Everybody here knows everybody else's hopeless looks. You got this big smile on your face now because you're thinking about it. Yep, we do. I know that hopeless look. We know them a lot better than the other person. We don't know our own so well, but we know other, other people's hopeless looks. And thus, internal counts are made. All this imagination prevents us asking ourselves, why has your life been like this? Just ask yourself, well, why has my life been like this? <gasps> it was all my father's fault. Oh, my mother was such a... <clears throat> oh, my brothers. My brothers, my sisters, my family. Uh, uh, uh. That teacher. It's all about them. Why has your life been that? It's their fault. And as long as we're pointing out there, we're never going to get to the root of it, which is in here. Real conscience is the beginning of awakening. Without real conscience, you're not going to wake up. So you've got to start to have some connection with real conscience. With real conscience, you don't exist as a personality. It doesn't care about you. Real conscience is the same for everybody. It is no respecter of persons. It's not interested in your story. Real conscience will tell you what is real. And it's why we have so little to do with real conscience. We're not interested in hearing what's real. We're interested in someone agreeing with our story. And it's why I can be so tacky. Because I probably won't agree with your story. When you come to tell me about what a horrible person your wife is and what a horrible person your husband is, what they're doing that's all wrong, I don't talk about them. I talk about you. And so you stop coming. It's enough of that. I'm not going over to talk to him. I know what he's going to say about her. He's going to say it's my fault. And it's not my fault. It's her fault. Now you need to find somebody who's going to agree with you. But you don't have to go far. Just talk to yourself, which is then what you spend your time doing, talking to yourself, having this little dialogue inside of yourself. And that's called internal consideration. And the next thing you know, you're screwed by yourself because you didn't want to hear the truth. 
See, the thing about real conscience is it answers to a higher power, but it can't awaken while imaginary I and false personality and their lying are dominant. So the first step is to start to make this imaginary I, this false personality, more passive. And the way to do that is to get out of it, to back away from it, to separate ourselves from it, and to begin to watch it, to begin to look at it, to begin to observe it, to begin to allow the light of consciousness to fall on it, because that weakens it. Acquired conscience is nearly useless in the work. It's like following a firefly instead of the North Star while you're navigating in the middle of the ocean. Low percentage thing to do. But people do it all the time. And the acquired conscience is what we've acquired. Oh, that's wrong to do that. Don't do that. Don't say that to Mrs. Hubbard because that'll hurt her feelings. And you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings because that's wrong. That's acquired conscience. It's all morals. It's all based on changeable things. In this country, it's okay to lie. In this country, it's a terrible thing to lie about this. But you can lie about that. We're over here in this country. This shape of a woman is absolutely gross and horrible. But over here in this country, that same shape is like hubba hubba. I've died and gone to heaven. It's all changeable. And that's what acquired conscience is. It's all changeable. It's all, it won't help you. It won't lead you. It's like following a firefly instead of the North Star. The North Star is there. That's it. It's stuck there. You can count on it. The earth moves, everything else moves, but it doesn't for our navigational purposes. Real conscience is a star from outside of our system, and that's why we need it. Because in order to have a real point, a point that's not constantly changing and swirling away, it's got to come from outside of our system. Real conscience is the same for everyone. Everyone who contacts real conscience knows the real truth, begins to see truth. They agree. This isn't right. They agree. It's not right to take life. They agree. Acquired conscience, well, it's okay to take life. Just certain life. See, it's all changeable. It's on a sliding scale. But real conscience, no, it's not. Everything has a right to live. And you don't have the right to say what has the right to live and what has not got the right to live. Acquired conscience teaches us to follow the horses on the merry-go-round that we're riding. It's all in this little system. And on this little system of all the horses on the merry-go-round, well, there's this horse and there's that horse and there's the spotted pony and there's this one over here and there's the dapple gray and then there's that big black stallion over there and then there's that beautiful white horse over there. And we can change horses all the time. As long as we're on the merry-go-round, it's all fine. It's what acquired conscience does. It just teaches us to stay on the merry-go-round. Real conscience leads us to real I. Real I leads us out of this prison of lies that we've unconsciously built around us this imaginary I and false personality. Real conscience leads us out of that. If you want out of this, you need to begin to awaken real conscience. You need to have the courage to follow it. You need to have the sincerity to be able to look at yourself and see that you are not who you said you are. You are not who your mother said you are. You're not who your father said you are. You're not who your teacher said you are. You're not who anyone said you are. You're not who I say you are. And I'm not saying who you are. If you'll remember from the very beginning, I said, I don't know who you are. You will have to discover that yourself. You are who you were created to be. I don't know who your essential self is. Do you have the courage to discover it? And that's the question for us now and really forevermore. Next week, we'll talk about something else. And then the week after that, we're going to come back to the Doctrine of Eyes again.